Well, let me encourage you, if you would, to go ahead and grab your Bible and join me in the book of Ephesians. If you don't have a Bible with you today, we want you to know there are Bibles all over the room in the backs of the seats there. And we would encourage you to grab one so that you can see for yourself what the Word of God is saying. And I do wanna say just a, a special word of welcome to those of you who are new to Shades and those who are joining us online right now. We're so grateful that you are a part of this service and a part of what God is doing here it shades. Ephesians chapter two is where we're gonna be spending some time this morning. We, we're walking through a series right now in the book of Ephesians, and we have come to verse 11 this morning, but I'm actually gonna jump ahead to verse 14 to read our opening text. We will deal with 11, 12, and 13 in just a moment, but I wanna read verses 14 through 16 just to set the stage of where we're going this morning as we talk specifically about what it means means to be united in Christ. Now remember, this letter is written to the church. So to be united in Christ is, is what the, the church is called to do, what the church is called to be. We're to be united in Christ. And this has implications for the way we interact with the world. This certainly has implications for the way we interact with one another. And it all flows out of what Christ has done for us. So I'd like to invite you to stand right back up with me. I know you just were seated, but stand with me for the reading of God's word, Ephesians chapter two, verses 14 through 16. We stand because we are standing as a church on the word of God. It is our foundation. And the word of God, as we say each week, lays before us what God says is right and good and true. And how many know you need to hear a word from the Lord today? So listen to what the scripture lays before us. Speaking of Jesus Christ, the apostle Paul writes, for he himself is our peace. He has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. The word of God is speaking to what divides us, and the word of God is showing us what it means to be united in Christ, these are challenging verses, and we need to pray together that God would show us what we need to see. So let's do that right now. Pray with me. Father, as we stand before you and as we now turn our attention to your divine, holy scripture, the specific revelation that you have laid before us through the prompting of your spirit guiding the human authors of the text. Lord, I know what you have to say through your word is what we need to hear. And so I pray, Lord God, as we step into this time that you truly would have your way among us, that you would show us what we need to see, that you would tell us what we need to hear. And Lord, I pray that you'd give us a willing and open heart and spirit to that which you say, that we would not be the same. It's not an accident that we're here today. It's not an accident that we're looking at this passage of scripture. You are with us, you are guiding us, and I pray, Lord God, that it would not be wasted on us. Use this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing with me. When we start to talk about unity, it's one of those words that appears, honestly, a little too good to be true, right? The culture tries to talk about unity. We're gonna get into some of that in a moment. This is a, a buzzword right now in our culture, united unity. And yet, the reality is, everywhere we look, in every topic that we deal with, what do we see around us? We see division all throughout the world. We see division in every different category. 
We see people choosing sides. We see people building walls. We see people going one direction or another and, and going after those who disagree. We see division as it relates to relationships for sure, but we see division as it relates to cultural issues, to preferences, to opinions. It's interesting to note that just recently, the Pew Research Group did a, a research study where they asked the question of people, what is the biggest threat to our nation? And the number one answer to that question, the biggest threat to our nation, is the people who have opposing views from our own. Think about that. On both sides of the issue, on both sides of the aisle, whatever the topic may be, we have a tendency to believe that the greatest threat to our nation are the people who have opposing views from our own. What that means, listen to this, what that means is the only thing that we can agree upon is that everyone else is the problem. We're in agreement that those who share a different opinion than ours are the biggest threat and the biggest problem. And certainly we would be naive, even ignorant, if we were to say, hey, there's division in our culture, but there's not division that seeps into churches. But the reality is, division in the church, oftentimes, even though it is unspoken, is a significant issue. Many churches remain divided as it relates to preference. Many churches remain divided as it relates to race. Many churches remain divided as it relates to cultural issues or socioeconomic status. There is division that, that has a way of seeping into the church. And with this in mind, we turn our attention to what the Word of God is saying here in Ephesians 2 as we recognize the Apostle Paul is very much aware of the threat of division seeping into this early church, one of the first churches, the church in Ephesus. The context of the church in Ephesus is a, a group of people gathered together now because of what Christ has done, because of what they have received in the good news of the gospel. But these people that have gathered together in the church of Ephesus, they have gathered from many different places. They come with many different backgrounds. They've had many different experiences. They're at different places on the social ladder. They're at different places racially. There are different places economically. And the Apostle Paul understands when you gather people together from different backgrounds with different experiences and different looks even, you potentially are going to have some challenges on your hand. For so often we focus in on the differences. So often we highlight the things that can divide us to the neglect of what can truly bring us together for what matters most. And so Paul addresses this head on. He addresses this very real and very difficult topic of unity in the church in the midst of the differences, in the midst of the different backgrounds, in the midst of the different races. He, he goes right to the heart of the matter. But I want you to notice, before we look back at these verses, I want you to notice where this falls in this letter to the church in Ephesus. This is not what Paul leads with in Ephesians 1, verse 1. No, the Apostle Paul is speaking about the importance of unity in Christ and speaking about the, the danger and the destructive nature of division in the church after he has time and time and time again proclaimed the good news of the gospel. In fact, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, all the way up to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where we were last week on Easter Sunday, every part of this letter at the beginning is all about the gospel. Over and over and over again, the Apostle Paul says, let me tell you, let me remind you, let me show you what Christ has done for you. Let me show you the good news 
The sacrificial death of Jesus Christ at the cross and the power of his resurrection and what it means for you as it relates to a relationship with God, a a vertical relationship between God and man. Jesus has done for us what we can never do for ourselves. Over and over and over again, Paul says, look at the gospel. Listen to the gospel. Be reminded of the gospel. And when we come to verse 11, and he begins to talk about something very challenging, it's important for us to know the gospel has laid the foundation. This is in light of what Christ has done. And these verses that we're looking at in the the second half of Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 11, going to the end of the chapter, that's what we'll deal with next week, 17 through 22 we'll deal with next week. These verses, they really serve as a bridge, if you will, in this letter. Because beginning in chapter 3 of Ephesians, Paul's going to now deal with the horizontal implications of the gospel. He's been talking about the vertical implications, what the gospel means for us as it relates to relationship with God. And he's going to transition and talk about the horizontal implications of the gospel, what the gospel does to us and through us as it relates to relationship with others and the way we interact with the world. But these verses, verses 11 through 22, they are a bridge. And they show us Before the word of God here in Ephesians talks about the way we should live in light of the gospel, the word of God makes it clear on this bridge, Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, that the gospel has created something new. The gospel has taken something that was old, something that was divided, something that was torn apart, and has now made something new because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that new thing that has been created is the church of Jesus Christ. Two become one. Division becomes unity because of what Christ has done. Let's step back into the text and let's see the power of what is proclaimed in this portion of the letter to the church in Ephesus. Ephesians 2, verse 11. We see this. It says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, what is this talking about? Well, the church in Ephesus is a church that has many people who are non-Jewish that are a part of it. They're called Gentiles. Very different from from the the Jewish background, the Jewish faith. The the Gentiles had a very different way of living. They had very different belief system. They had even different socioeconomic status in the culture than the Jews. And the Jews and the Gentiles were divided in every way. In fact, it would be very difficult for us today to truly understand the hostility that existed between the Jews and the Gentiles. There was division culturally. There was division preferentially. There was division racially. But on top of it all, there was division religiously. So you take all these issues and you put them in a blender and you get this powder keg of hostility, one group towards the other. The Jews hated the Gentiles. The Gentiles hated the Jews. And this hostility was so intense and so real that the Jews began to create laws around how they must stay away from Gentiles altogether. In fact, one of the laws that the Jewish people held to at the time, that it was against the law for a Jew to help a Gentile woman give birth or to assist in the birthing process, because to help a Gentile woman give birth would be helping bring another godless heathen into the world.
This is two groups of people that adamantly hated one another. There was racism, there was classism, there was elitism. The Gentiles couldn't stand the Jews because the Jews looked down on the Gentiles. The Jews believed that the Gentiles were lesser than them. This hostility is intense. And so the Apostle Paul, writing to a church that has many Gentiles who are a part of it, is saying, hey, remember that time in your life when you were separated from God? Remember Gentiles when when you were considered unworthy by the Jews? Remember when you had no access to God because you had not been given his word and you had not been given the promises of the covenant? Do Do you remember that? And he's not saying remember it in case they forgot. They remember. The pain is real. We're not talking about generations ago. We're talking about years ago or even maybe just moments ago that the Gentiles are aware of the hostility that exists between the Jews and the Gentiles. The scabs have not healed yet. They remember the pain of this hostility. They remember the pain of this division. Paul's not saying, hey, remember, because I don't want you to forget. He's saying, hey, as you remember, think now about the new reality that you have experienced through the power of the gospel. This is so good, what Paul says. He's not saying remember because you don't know what it was like years and years ago. No, he's saying, remember how different your life now is because of what Christ has done. Remember that Jesus has changed everything for you. Remember the power of the gospel. And then in verse 13, he says, but now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. This vertical gift that God has provided for man through his son, Jesus Christ, offering his life at the cross. Remember, those who were far off have now been brought near. And that certainly has meaning as it relates to our relationship with God. Before a relationship with God, you and I would be far from God. We, we can only be brought near through the blood of Jesus Christ. But please hear this. This also now has horizontal implications. This has implications between how we interact with one another. And those who were far off, the Gentiles, those who were seen as less than the Gentiles, those who were seen as unworthy, the Gentiles, those who intentionally would be avoided, the Gentiles, now they've been brought near. And it's if Paul is saying to the church, so church, what are you gonna do about it? Because God is creating something new. So this can't look like the old. God is doing something new. This can't be like the old. Those who are far off have now been brought near. Church, how will you respond to that? Will you ignore those who don't look like you or don't have the same background you have? Or will you recognize there is power in the gospel to tear down walls and create something new? Will you point to Jesus in the way you interact with those who are not like you? Church, what will you do about it? For those who are far off through the gospel are brought near. This is good news for the body of Christ. Certainly, we see this beautiful gift, this this vertical gift, because we cannot get to God, Christ came to us. He gave us this gift of his life at the cross, the power of the blood that we just sang about that washes us white as snow, that makes us clean, that forgives us and makes us a new creation. That's this vertical implication. But then it begins to impact the way we live in the world and the way we interact with one another. And as verse 14 then says, it makes peace. For he, Jesus, he himself is our 
peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Paul says as he's writing this letter to the church, church, it would be very easy for you to divide, Jew and Gentile. To have a little church service over here for the Jews and a little church service over here for the Gentiles. To have a little church service over here for those who look like you and have a little church service over here for those who don't look like you. We've been really good at that in our city. To have a church service over here for those who have the same background as you and to have a church service over here for those who don't have your background. But Jesus Christ has come to tear down the wall. Jesus Christ has come to bring two very different, very divided peoples together as one, to create something new altogether, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. The question for us in the church is do we believe this? And I'm not just talking about do we believe it in head knowledge, do we believe this in theory? I'm talking about the horizontal implications of the gospel. Do we believe this in the way we interact with other people? Do we believe this in the way we interact with and even pursue those who don't look like us or come from the same background as us? Do we believe this? Do we believe that Jesus truly changes everything? The Apostle Paul does something so brilliant here as he is talking about this very important issue in the life of the church. He uses a very literal, very real example of this spiritual reality of a wall being torn down and something new being created. In fact, he's calling to mind the strict rules that the the Jewish people would be very familiar with as it related to the temple in Jerusalem. And even though this is a church in Ephesus, there would have been some people who at least would certainly have been familiar with the temple, some who would have ventured to the temple, many who would have experienced the temple in person. Paul is saying, you know, when you go to the temple in Jerusalem, it's beautiful, it's magnificent. It's unlike anything you see anywhere else. It's, it's a work of art, it's pointing to the glory and the beauty of God. It's majestic. And when you go to the temple, you, you realize that there are, there are different areas where different people can go. There is an outer court where Jews and Gentiles both can gather. Anyone is welcome in the outer court. But then there's a wall. A wall that separates the outer court from the inner courts where only Jews can go. That wall became known as the wall of hostility. The wall of hostility that separated different types of people. It said, you're not welcome here. You can't go in here. And Paul is saying that wall of hostility has been torn down. And I want to ask you for a moment to put on your historical hat just for a moment. This letter to the church in Ephesus is written somewhere roughly around 60 to 62 AD. Paul is writing to this church and saying, the wall of hostility, a very literal place in the temple court, the wall of hostility has been torn down with no way of knowing that in just a few short years, in 70 AD, when Rome moves into Jerusalem with force, and tears the temple to the ground, pushing the stones of the temple off the Temple Mount. You can go to Jerusalem today and see them, these massive stones that that have left craters in the ground at the base of the Temple Mount. They're there today. 
The wall has been torn down. And the people have no way of knowing, wait, you can't, you can't tear down the temple. You can't tear down that wall. And Paul is saying, listen, the wall of hostility has been torn down. This would be shocking to those who are hearing this letter, for they knew what that wall represented, and they knew how intense the division of that wall truly was. In fact, in 1871, a group of archaeologists who were doing a dig around the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, they found a stone that that is a stone that was part of the wall of hostility. It had an inscription on it in both Greek and Hebrew so that anyone who could read at the time would be able to understand the significance of this wall. And this is what was inscribed on that stone at the wall of hostility at the Temple in Jerusalem. Listen to this. We've talked about this before, but listen to this. No man of another race is to proceed within the partition and the enclosing wall about the sanctuary. Anyone arrested there will have himself to blame for the penalty of death, which will be imposed as a consequence. No man of another race is to proceed within the partition and enclosing wall about the sanctuary. What painful, painful words to read. If we're honest, in the history of our own city, there have been very similar words said, very similar words written. You worship over here, we'll worship over here. You're invited to go over there, but you're not invited to come over here. We're okay with you gathering right there, but don't you dare gather right here. Dividing wall of hostility. A very real, powerful, divisive, painful reality. The Jews and the Gentiles were very familiar with this division. And here the word of God is saying to the people of God, if you truly understand the vertical implications of what God has done for man, if you truly understand the incredible love and grace that has been offered to you through Jesus Christ, by grace through faith you have been saved, if you truly understand what the gospel means for your relationship with God, it will begin to impact the way you live in relationship with others. There are vertical implications. There are horizontal implications. There is a cross of Jesus Christ that changes everything. And the question is, will we believe it? The wall of hostility through the gospel of Jesus Christ has been torn down. He has made peace creating something new altogether. You see, the gospel is not a message of the good versus the bad or the worthy versus the unworthy or the clean versus the unclean or the religious versus the rebel or this race against that race or this background against that background. No, the gospel is the message that says Sinners like me desperately need a savior. And when sinners like me that desperately need the savior receive the good news of what the savior has done, it must change the way I live. For the gospel creates something new. And please hear this. This is so important in our 
culture today. Unity is not about sameness according to the gospel. The gospel does not ask us to abandon our background or even our diversity. What the gospel does is the gospel invites us to come together in the midst of our differing backgrounds, in the midst of our diversity for the sake of something greater for the sake of something new, for the sake of something that stands out as unique and beautiful to the watching world around us. This is what the church is to be because of what Christ has done. For you see, in Jesus Christ, there is no classism. There is no superior race. There is no entitled people. The gospel levels the playing field and invites anyone of any background to come and receive this good news of what Christ has done. The gospel ushers in a new people who come under the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ. So can I ask you, personally, How in the world could anyone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus Christ live with hostility towards those who don't look like them or come from where they come from? How could anyone, according to the word of God, if we really believe the Bible, how could anyone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus Christ possibly elevate their own personal preference and agenda and background above coming together with other believers for the sake of exalting the name of Jesus? How could we hold on to what divides us when the gospel unites us? There are some challenging questions to consider from this text, but first we go back to verse 16 as we conclude our study in Ephesians 2 for today. It says this, that we, that he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Killing the hostility. Taking two very different, making into one new creation, killing the hostility. And the question we must ask when we read Ephesians 2 verse 16 is, can this really be our reality? Can the church of Jesus Christ, the local church, be a place where what divides us And what is different about us could actually be laid aside for the sake of something greater. Could the hostilities of our differences be brought to the cross for the sake of something new? With that question in mind, I just want to turn real quickly to Ephesians 2. We're wrapping this up right now. Excuse me, to to Acts chapter 2. We're in Ephesians 2. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 shows us the very beginning of the church. Riggs referenced this earlier in our time of singing. Acts chapter 2 is that amazing, supernatural, miraculous moment that we now refer to as Pentecost, where the Spirit of God fell on those first believers, those first followers of Christ. It was like a mighty, rushing wind blowing through the room, ushering in something new, creating something new, something called the church. The body of Christ was created at this beautiful, sacred moment. The old is gone, the new has come. And after Pentecost, Peter stands up and proclaims the first sermon of this new church. He he invites all who are listening to repent of their sin, to turn to Jesus, to be forgiven, to be covered in his grace, to become part of his body, the church. And on that day, the scripture says in Acts 2 that over 3,000 people trusted their life to Jesus Christ, and the church explodes on the scene. The church is born. 
And out of this amazing, supernatural, miraculous, spirit-filled time in the early church, we see this ridiculous statement, a truly ridiculous statement. Acts chapter two, verse 44. It says, all who believed were together and had all things in common. That's ridiculous. All who believed were together and had all things in common. All these believers, 3,000 people called that day in Jerusalem from different backgrounds, from different races, from different places on the economic ladder, from different social status. All these people from all these different backgrounds were together and had all things in common. That's ridiculous. How in the world could that be true? Well, there's only one possible answer. There's only one possible answer how all of these people with all of these different backgrounds and all of these different stories could be together with all things in common. They have all things in common. Listen to this, don't miss this. Because they have one thing in common. They have all things in common because they have one thing in common and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the focus of the early church. Jesus is the agenda for this first church. Jesus is the point. And please hear this. When Jesus is the point, unity becomes a byproduct. See, this is where our culture totally misses this altogether. The goal is not unity. The goal is Jesus. The goal is exalting the name of Christ. And if the goal is unity, you're gonna be fighting about what you're to be united on. But when the goal is Jesus, when there is one thing in common, unity becomes the byproduct that leads to something new and beautiful being created to demonstrate the good news of what Christ has done to a divided and broken world. So can this be true of us? Can we be a church that has all things in common because we have one thing in common? Can we be a church that not only is fine with people from different backgrounds, or fine with people who don't look like us showing up, but can we be a church that actively and intentionally pursues those who are not like us for the sake of something new being created to demonstrate the beautiful power of the gospel? Do you realize there are few things more countercultural than laying aside our differences for the sake of something greater? That's not the norm. There are few things that are more countercultural than saying, I know there's a lot of things we can be divided on, but there is something greater here, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we're gonna focus on. And when we have that in common, it changes the way we live. That stands out. This is an incredible opportunity for a church in our culture that is so divided to look completely different from the world around us. See, here's the reality. We love to build walls, and our God loves to tear them down. And so the question is, are we working against what God is doing? Are we joining in with what God is doing? So let me close with just an individual, personal question for you to consider, and then a corporate question for all of us to wrestle with as a church. The individual, personal question is this. Think about this in your own life as we wrap this up. Where in your life, where in your world, where in your current context are you more passionate about your personal preferences 
than you are about exalting Jesus Christ. It could just be your opinions on an issue. It could be the things that you possess. It could be what you're trying to achieve. It could be a refusal to forgive someone. It could be the way you view those who are not like you. Where are your personal preferences more valuable to you than exalting Jesus Christ? Would you invite the Spirit to do a work in your life in whatever he reveals? And then finally, a question for us to consider as a local church here at Shades Mountain. Are we who claim to be the people of God, the church of Jesus Christ, are we who claim to be the people of God willing to put aside our personal preferences for the sake of exalting Jesus that the gospel can advance even more through us? For the cross of Christ has killed the hostility and torn down the wall. Will we? Will we be a people who lead with forgiveness and grace? Will we be a people who, who not only are willing to reach across the aisle when someone shows up, but we're willing to reach across the street to those who have yet to join us? Will we be a people who looks like heaven or will we be a people who all look the same? I believe with all of my heart that God has given us this beautiful, great church at Shades Mountain, an amazing opportunity, an amazing invitation to stand out as a new creation in this city that we love? Will we lay aside our personal preferences for the sake of exalting Jesus? Let me pray for us as we close. Father God, I thank you for your word, the challenge of your scripture it speaks specifically into what we wrestle with in our own hearts. Lord, we have been challenged, I have been challenged by what you say in Ephesians chapter two. And I pray, Lord God, that you would give me, give us the faith to believe you at your word, to not just believe it in theory, but to believe it in action, to believe it in practice, to believe it in the way we interact with others. Oh, we praise you for the good news of the gospel, the vertical good news that invites us to be made right with you through the gift of Jesus Christ, by grace through faith. And we pray, Lord God, that that good news would dictate and drive and change the way we interact with others on the horizontal plane because of the power of the cross. Father, we wanna see you do something that only you can do. We wanna see walls torn down. We wanna see a beautiful mosaic Father, we want to see something new created. And we want to see the light of the gospel shine brightly through us for your glory, that the name of Jesus would be exalted in all that we do and with all that we are and in all who we interact with, not just those who look like us, not just those who live like us, but all who believe like us that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord. Please, Lord, do a work in and through us. Whatever we need to lay down, give us the faith to do so, that you would be exalted. And Father, as I close, I pray specifically for those who are here today who realize they need a relationship with you as Savior and Lord, the, the vertical implications of the gospel have yet to be received in their life. I pray, Lord God, that today would be the day 
where they would say, Jesus, I need you. Save me, Jesus. I'm ready to trust you. I'm ready for my sin to be forgiven. I'm ready to be a new creation, to join in with what you are doing through your body, the church, to demonstrate the gift of this new creation to the world. Oh, Father, it is our prayer that many more would be saved and experience the good news of who you are and what you have done. We thank you for your love and your grace. Guide us as we seek to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray.